right. We got a lot of stuff to cover here tonight. So we got through two chapters last week. I don't know if we have to get this exactly done during Lent, do we? We can, there's no time. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Drew and I looked at the, um, at the um, stuff from Adam Hamilton that, uh, that we looked at last week. And he and I were in agreement that, that that video works when you buy the thick book and you go through, you know, a thick chapter and then he just kind of hits the highlights here. So it's a difference. But, you know, we'll use it ourselves for a little bit of background research if we, uh, if we need that. So um, might refer to it, but I think we've got, we can pool enough of our knowledge and ignorance here to get the class <laughs> together. Pretty young, um, like you said, he, it's good if you want kind of a touch and go, but he doesn't have the depth of. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, um, let's get started. Let's have a prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, your word is a living word, it cuts both ways. <clears throat> For those who are comfortable, it afflicts, and those who are afflicted, it brings comfort. Use your word, O oh Lord, to touch us precisely where that, that need is greatest, that it may come alive within us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll start us out, and I'll just uh, jump it over to you whenever you want to jump in here. We're in chapter 3 of John's Gospel. Having gone through the first two. Um, in fact, uh, um, chapter two, we had the cleansing of the temple, and uh, that's our text for the coming Sunday. So if you want to hear that again, Drew is preaching here, and I'll be up at Concord. So, All right, chapter three. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and says to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right. Remember, John, we need to get into the details here. So what we know about Nicodemus is that he is a Pharisee. And Pharisees, of course, get a bad reputation. But for the longest time, especially like before Christ, they were the good guys. The Pharisees were a lay movement to recapture those who had gone away from the, the basic teachings of the Old Testament, the, the Jewish scriptures. And then over time, as they got to be more and more in the, um, I guess the, the, the center, the, mid, the midstream, um, they kind of took that more to heart and they began abusing it, showing that I've got more piety than you've got more piety. And that's where we get that Pharisaic idea. But the word Pharisee literally means the, uh, the apart one, the set apart one. Meaning that they were the ones who were not gonna succumb at the time to the Greek influence that had come in with Alexander the Great. And that Greek influence then came across all of the Palestine area to the point that people were moving away from the Judaic culture into Greek culture. And it really came to a head in the 167 BC in which really the Greek culture took over completely. And that's where the Maccabean revolt came and part of that revolt then was to get back to the basic teachings of the Old Testament, the Jewish scripture. That's the origin of the Pharisees. So they were the good guys. In fact, I just heard this, what were we, maybe we heard together, is that there was um, some scholarship that wanted to suggest that Jesus was actually a Pharisee. That's right, that was Corey Driver last fall. Corey Driver talked about that because he was eating in the Pharisee's house and he was known to be kind of a separate one and different. So interesting, if I hadn't heard that before. No, neither. Yeah. 
So Nicodemus is a Pharisee. We're going to hear about Nicodemus later on after the death of Jesus as well. So stay tuned. There'll be a nice inclusio with Nicodemus. And when does he come to when does he come to Jesus? By night. By night. Looking at the details here, what does that suggest? He was ashamed. Well, <laughs> didn't want to be seen. Didn't want to be seen next to Jesus. Now, if you if you peel that proverbial Johannian onion, it could also mean not just the physical darkness of night, but could come that he was spiritually in the dark as well. Because he really didn't know these things of God. He begins with a flattery. You know, you sometimes hear these debates on the Congress floor. I yield to the good and generous, respected colleague from the great state of Kansas. Well, perhaps he was doing the same thing. But Jesus, but Jesus doesn't bite. He doesn't go into that flattery. So right after you must be such a great teacher of God, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. A strange response to an introductory comment by Nicodemus. Now, the first words of Jesus, truly, truly, I say unto you, what does this first suggest? Emphasis. Emphasis. This is important. You know, it's really important in Scripture, they say it three times, holy, holy, holy. If it's pretty important, they say it twice, truly, truly, I say unto you. All right? So, perk up. Unless one is born anew. Mine says born anew. What does your say? Born again. Born again. Born again. Born again. Born again. He, what's the next word? Cannot. Now, all of us remember our English teacher in middle school. Now, all of us remember our English teacher in middle school. What's happening there? All right, there we go. One and done, Nate. What's happening there? Maybe you should uh, already know. Would you mute your uh, Maybe your you should audio? Would you mute your, uh, <laughs> your uh, It's a sign. Okay, now try it. That was it. All right, no pointing fingers at anyone. No one is to blame, but Lola, it was you. <laughs> 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 All right, so what was I saying here? We were talking about uh, no one. No, <laughs> no one. one. All right, in, in, in uh, English teacher, eighth grade, you rise, you raise your hand and say, teacher, can I go to the bathroom? And that teacher will wisely say, you probably can, but you're probably asking what? May I? May I use the restroom? Um, Jesus is not saying a person may, perhaps, there's a good possibility that he could see the kingdom of God. No, this is a, this is a, um, what a contractual sentence. This is an if-then sentence. Unless one is born anew or born again, that person cannot that is it is not possible to see the kingdom of god so jesus has now laid down a, a statement that is is pretty strongly worded and this is not billy graham this is not jimmy carter this is not uh, chuck Colson. this is saying you must be born Again, now we uh, we also perhaps remember the uh, the great dialogue between Abbott and Costello. 
about who's on first, who, the one on first, what? No, on second, who, the one on first? What's his name? On third. All right, so they're just not communicating, right? The words that they're using do not mean the same thing. So when Jesus uses the word born again, of course, in the Abbott and Costello fashion, Nicodemus is taking this in a different way. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? <laughs> a very narrow, specific, literal understanding of that word born again. And by the way, that word born again, or that phrase, is not just limited here to the third chapter. It's used a couple of times throughout John's Gospel. So it's an important thing for us to understand what it means to be born again. Verse 5. Jesus answered, truly, what? Truly? Again, pretty important. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he may not. No. He cannot. It is not possible to enter into the kingdom of God. Now let's peel back the onion a little bit. What might Jesus be referring to in this phrase? Maybe a, sp a spiritual rebirth? It's certainly talking about a spiritual rebirth and not a physical one because we're not entering to the womb a second time. Good. What else? Also says Baptism? Born. Baptism? Baptism? Yeah, it's born of water and the spirit. It is, as Luther talks about, it is the water and the word together that makes a baptism work. So it could be an allusion then to, to baptism. Six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you should be, oh man, strong words here, isn't it? You must be born again. <clears throat> so now we have to ask the obvious question, how then is a person born again? And I think, I think Jesus is being very specific about that analogy to be born again. Because he's even talking about flesh from flesh and then spirit from spirit. And so how closely do we make that same connection? That is, how many of us chose, decided, accepted when we were going to be physically born? Naria one. Naria one. Jesus uses that same imagery when he talks about the spiritual birth. Because then he talks about it's really not really dependent on us per se, because he says this, the wind blows where it wills. And of course, Jesus is doing a word play here. We've talked about that before last week when he talked about the word wind and the word spirit and the word breath is the exact same word in both Greek and Hebrew. So now he's doing a bit of a word play. The spirit blows where it wills. Is it the spirit or is it the wind? It could be both. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it that is rustling in the, in the leaves across the trees, but you don't know whence it comes and where, where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Now Nicodemus is completely confused at what Jesus is talking about. 
that you must be born again. I, I, I get it. It's something spiritual. I'm not going into my mother's womb a second time. But then you're telling me it's something with the spirit that's really out of my control. Well, then how can a person be born again? Let's go on. Verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, how can this be? Huh? We're asking the same question. How can this be? And Jesus says, are you a teacher of Israel? And you, you do not understand this? You're a Pharisee? You're the one, the standard and norm by which all others will be measured? You're the set apart one? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. And here in verse 12, now, actually, this would be good to have the Greek with us here. Is that you there? Is that y'all? <clears throat> or is that you? Because <laughs> it could very well, I bet if we went and dug into that, you're going to check that? Um, I bet it's a plural. Because by this time, the animosity between the Pharisees and the Christians was great. I'm going to guess. I'm going to give it like a 75% chance. This is plural, yeah. Let's see here. All right. Oh. Um, All right. He'll look it up. All right. <laughs> um, 12. If I have told you of earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? And then it gets very complicated, especially thinking about Nicodemus at night trying to figure this out. Of course, we, on the other side of the cross, it makes sense, but not to Nicodemus. 13, no one has ascended into heaven, but one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. What? But look at 14. Look at 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. All right, remember we talked about this when we went through Deuteronomy a long time ago. So remember in the wilderness, in the wilderness there was a time in which God was punishing God's people by sending poisonous snakes. And they were being bitten and they were being killed. And they run up to Moses and say, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Tell God we're sorry. And so then God has Moses build a bronze snake, which seems to go against the very first commandment, doesn't it? Yeah. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall bow down to no idols. You shall not make any graven images. But what do I know? So then what, what Moses did, remember the story, Moses puts the bronze snake on a pole. Well, if anyone is bit, you're supposed to turn to the pole and, I don't know, pray or kneel or do something. But you cast your eyes on this, on this bronze serpent. And then they're, they're healed or they're, they're not, they're not going to die from the snake bite. So the question is, and this is maybe, how far deep do you go into this? This is another <laughs> layer into the, how do you attach a bronze snake to a pole. Do you take the pole and take the bronze snake next to it and you wrap your twine around it and say, look at it, or to really display it so everybody can see it no matter how far away are you, would you perhaps put the pole and put the snake like this on the pole? So that when you're bit, you look upon is it a cross? Or is, it, is this what John is thinking about? They're looking to the cross. Looking to the cross. Just as Moses, I'll just say this here. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. interesting to see what, what John may do with that. Yeah. And then verse 16. I'll throw something in. Please. 
Um, I read something interesting this week, or read it, heard it. Yeah, the um, that bronze serpent was taken into Israel, stayed there for a long time through the judges and through some of the kings, and um, and the the Hebrews, the Israelis, got to the point where they were doing idol worship that they learned in Canaan, but they got to the point where that was that bronze serpent was one of the objects of their uh, idol worship. And King Hezekiah, um, I believe it was Hezekiah, had it destroyed because of that. Oh, I can see that. I can see that. And then verse 16, we're going to read this one together here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know what I mean? gospel in a nutshell as it is often said however what is often not quoted is the next verse for god sent the son into the world not to condemn the world the world might be saved through him is this section not uh sort of jesus setting the groundwork for baptism because that's what's really coming up next yeah oh his baptism is next yes i see this certainly the imagery that john <laughs> is uh is, is baptismal though though he doesn't talk baptism specifically it's just kind of he just introduces some of the imagery Scott, before we move on, I want to back up a minute to this born again thing. I remember when I was in my early 20s, newly married, living away from home for the first time, really. And somebody would knock on the door and say to me, have you been born again? Holding their Bible. <laughs> what do you say to that when you were baptized a Lutheran, raised a Lutheran, confirmed as a Lutheran? All I can say is I never didn't believe. So what is that? What does that mean to me? You know, um, different uh, different groups will. Ha All right, let me just say this, Glenda. I get when a person asks that question. There's a correct answer, isn't there? And there's a Lutheran answer. There's a correct answer <laughs> that they're looking for. September first, nineteen seventy-six, at okay. camp. When I was 12 years old, right? <laughs> you know, how do we answer that question? We can we can answer it. I mean, from our Lutheran perspective, where most of us, perhaps not all, most of us were baptized as infants, and a lot of us grew up never knowing a time in which we didn't know Jesus. So you could um, you could answer that by by um, by really upsetting them. And, and say, on February 19th, 1961, on the day that I was baptized. And they don't like that answer. No. That's the wrong answer. You could go, you could go historical on them, and, and you could say, uh, in the year 33, in a garbage heap outside of the gates of Jerusalem on a cross, I was born again. Um, or, you know, you could, you could talk in terms of our understanding of God's, God's grace. And I never knew a time in which I didn't know the love of Jesus. Um, but they're look, but maybe we should ask the question, how do you get born again? If it is by the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and I want to be born again, <clears throat> how do I, how do I do that? You know, I uh, I enjoy sailing. Pastor, you yeah. ask. What's that? You ask. You well, ask hopefully the answer here, Catherine. How else, unless you ask God? Oh, you ask. Oh, I thought. Okay, good. Yes. What did yeah. you say? I was thinking from my from my sailing background is that I can't I can't control the wind. I tried can't but what i can do is i can move the sails in such a way that i can take the most advantage of whatever wind i have 
my thoughts, and I'll turn it over to you after this, Drew, uh, my thought is, um, is that we can do things in which we can catch the most amount of wind or spirit that is possible. That is things like prayer and worship. That is things like asking for the spirit to come into our hearts. That is opening up ourselves in such a way that we do not despise, but that we receive it with gladness. When Luther talked about this election, he used the word election, that is God's doing, he said that the way that this happens is that we receive it. We do not despise the word of God, but we receive it gladly and with trust and, uh, and, and faithfulness. And then the spirit does its work of miracle of bringing forth faith. Now, boy, I would love to have a date on the calendar in which I did not believe and then I did believe. I'd love to have <laughs> yeah. really the miraculous experience. And I don't. Now, I would say, I would say, and maybe, maybe I could challenge the whole group here, even Glenda. <laughs> I would challenge her and ask the question, even though you were a baby Lutheran baptized, isn't there a time in which this baptismal faith became real? It's not like suddenly Jesus was not in my life and now he is in my life. I was not saved and now I am saved. But isn't there a time or maybe a short period of time in which you would say Jesus became important or real or personal or central in my life? And I would say yes to that. And maybe that's the question, Glenda. If I were knocking on the door, um, has Jesus been real to you? And that, I could certainly tell you stories for myself. And maybe others could yeah. too, right? I, I could say yes to that also, very much. Yeah. Yes. Let's finish this up that I have to turn it over to my younger, able partner here. <laughs> let me, let me, uh, if I, yeah. can, I want to tackle one other thought with that. Um, I, I think a big part of this is why has Nicodemus come to Jesus in the first place? I mean, he's, he is, like you say, he's a Pharisee, he's wealthy, he's a ruler of the Jewish people, but yet, and so he's a master in terms of following the law. There's nobody better. But he's got this, he's got this longing in his heart, this lack, that despite his efforts to follow the law perfectly, he still feels unfulfilled. He feels incomplete. And, um, you know, as I'm listening to you all share these these good thoughts, um, I, mean, I think playing off that, I think, too, it's, it's, it's that moment, those moments, maybe you could say even, when we realize that um, however hard we try to be good and righteous, etc., through our own efforts, we can't ever get there completely. So it has to be that moment of surrender of Jesus. You have to be the one to save me. Um, and I think I think those are probably moments that many of us can can identify too. Um, yeah. So I think I think this is great. That's a great line of thought. That you all were oh, I up. love that. I love that. As righteous as Nicodemus was in the sight of the world, right. he knew he was not righteous before God. And, and then what you asked me to look up for John chapter 3, verse 12, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, it's interesting, the Greek there, um, <coughs> look this up, there's a great website called blueletterbible.com, you can um, just search the, the languages, uh, it breaks it down, but what he says there is, I have spoken to you all, plural, of earthly things, and you, singular, do not believe. How then will you all believe if I speak of heavenly things? So he does both. He takes it from the general to the specific. I figured he was talking to the Pharisees, yeah. I'll do this last part pretty quickly. Now, a big theme in John's gospel is light and dark. Light and darkness. And just this last ending couple of verses, he picks up on that. Verse, verse 18. 
He who believes in him is not condemned, and he who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that is made clear, seen in his deeds brought by God. Now, light and dark. All right, do you want to pick it up at 22? 22, yeah. We don't see anywhere that Nicodemus actually left. Apparently, that was the end of the discussion. Yeah, but he comes back at the end of John's Gospel. Yeah. That not, yeah. So we think that it's stuck. Right. Something, yeah. something hooked there. Yeah. The other thing I saw that, going back to the night idea, um, I think all those things are true, that he's coming not to be seen. He's coming because it's, there's a representation of his spiritual searching. The other thing I, I'd never heard before, but as I was looking into this, is that um, rabbis recommended that you study the Torah or the, the Bible at nighttime because things were so busy during the day. You were working and going about your travels that um, it was just practically, too. It's the reason we're here at 6 o'clock in the evening rather than um, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So that, I think that's a third reason. Yeah, Good. interesting. Uh, all right, so now it, now it does, as Ed, you said, go back to this idea, this theme of baptism, baptism. You know, and people uh, often ask about what was baptism, what was the role of baptism uh, in the early church? And really, it, it evolves, it changes through the work of people like John the Baptist in Jesus and then the early church. Um, and, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the roles of baptism was for Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism, they would go through this ritual rebathing um, bathing ceremony that represented their becoming pure, their becoming part of the Jewish faith. Um, so when Jesus talks about being born of water and spirit, you have that water representing you know, purity, and then spirit, the power of God. That's going to be what changes you within. The spirit's going to do that work. Um, and John, what do you remember about John the Baptist? And who, who, who are his mom and dad? Elizabeth and Zachariah. Right. And both of them, not just Zachariah, but Elizabeth too, are from the priestly family of, of Israel, from the, um, the Levites. And so, and we're told Elizabeth is too. So John is a priest. He gets his religious credentials there, but he's not in the temple. He's not in the synagogue. He's been out in the country, in the wild. Um, why is he there? Why not be... Um, serving his priestly duties in the in the heart of Jerusalem. Well, I think a big part is John John realizes that things have gotten so far off course. Like the prophets we read about last fall, John is kind of the last of these Old Testament prophets. And when you're when you're able to get outside of that system, you're able to uh, sometimes. Um, Reform things. I think John is a reformer, so he's been part of uh, this work. So chapter 5, or sorry, chapter um, 3, verse 22 continues. Now coming out of this Nicodemus conversation. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them, and did what? He also right. baptized I don't know of any other place in the Gospels where it talks about Jesus himself baptizing people. But did Jesus baptize people, or was it not his disciple that baptized people? That's a great point, Renato. Great question, because in this same chapter, later it says, um, well, start of chapter 4, verse 1. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciple. But... I, I, it also says in that verse 22, and he baptized. Mm -hmm. So maybe he was maybe he was baptizing, but then later his disciples were too. It seems to say both. Um, does anybody read that differently there? <clears throat> Certainly, though, not a big part of Jesus' ministry 
You know, like Paul's going to say later, I, I wasn't sent to baptize primarily, but to preach and to, to teach. Um, but he does there as this um, as this part of this. He's a rabbi. Remember, that's, that's part of his, I think, his leadership. Now, John was also baptizing here, and because there was plenty of water, you know, which is important, and those need water. Yeah, those dry, arid conditions. People, look at this, people were constantly coming to be baptized, which implies these, these are not just Gentiles now, they're Jewish people too. Um, so here I think baptism's already begun to evolve. It's not just Gentiles, but they're, um, they're Jews who also see we need, we want to be prepared for whatever God is, is preparing to do. Remember, there, there, there is this messianic expectation God is going to rescue Israel from who? Who's the dominant power at the time? Rome. Rome. The Romans, right. That God is going to restore this beaten up little nation and give them back uh, some independence. But there's a hunger for people to constantly be coming out to John. This is before he was put in prison. Then an argument developed over some of the back, over the disciples of John and a certain Jew. You don't know who that, who that is unless... Uh, kind of implies later that that may have been Jesus, but I don't know why he would have said that that way, over the matter of ceremonial washing. So even then they were arguing about baptism, what it means, and and what does being born again mean. And those arguments have continued. But they came to John and said this, and this is where we're going to begin to see um, John model our each of our... Um, each of our path as a disciple of Christ. Because there were there were few people at that time who had a bigger <laughs> following, who had a bigger um, uh, platform than John. I mean, he was, as you can tell, people are constantly coming. He was, he was the man that people wanted to hear. And they're saying, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, he's baptizing, and everybody's going over to him. <laughs> Saving soul. Right, including some of Jesus' first disciples. We know that Andrew, and who then leads Brother Peter, was one of John's disciples initially. So these, these students would look for the teacher that they felt was best leading them and pointing them to God. And so they're leaving John because Jesus is speaking these words of truth and um, they're drawn to him. And John says, a man can only receive what is given from heaven. And he's going to talk here about how, you know, I've given, I've done my part. I have, I've pointed to, to him. But John, to his great credit, is going to say, um, it's time now for me to become less. Look at verse 30. He must become greater, and I must become less. Which is great thing to circle and underline for, uh, I think, Christian spirituality as a whole. What does it mean for us as, um, you know, as, as individuals to become it's less and less about us and more and more about us pointing to him? And John uses this great Jewish language of the bridegroom and the, um, the groom's um, attendant. That the bride is belonging to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and it's full of joy when he comes in. In the Jewish culture, I, I learned that there was a special, almost like the best man. That's what he's referring to. But it was even even more important than our modern day best man, because they plan the ceremony, they plan the, the festivities, a lot of that, and then um, he's saying he's going to get out of the way and be full of joy when the, the bride and the bridegroom. Now, who does the bride represent in the Bible? The church. The church, yeah. Israel, which the church will be, you know, the new Israel, the fulfillment of that. And then Jesus, of course, being the bridegroom. I know you guys studied last week the wedding of Cana and that great wedding imagery. Interesting uh, thing about John's note here. You know, we have throughout the church year these commemorations of people in the life of and the history of Christianity. Uh, John's 
feast day, when we remember John the Baptist, is um, right at the summer equinox, when the days of uh, the days of sunlight began to grow shorter. And so I think the church shows that purposely that you know just as the light is getting less and less until when. Right at Christmas, when the light started to get greater, that um, John is, is diminishing his role so that Jesus can be glorified and, and followed, praised. But, yeah. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who's from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. John is the philosophical one of the Gospels. He writes and teaches with, um, um, it's not Mark. Mark is very um, practical, almost kind of, you know, um, Spicano. give me the nuts and bolts. Yeah. John is going to focus, in some ways, it draws you in to sort of sit with the mystery of what he's talking about here. The one who comes from above, Jesus is so much greater than John because he, he's come from God. And now he's saying the one from earth belongs to the earth. That's John. And he testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it is certified that God is truthful. So he's, he's, really, a, he's really helping his followers to know that um, Jesus is so much more equipped. Why? Because he's seen above. He's, he, knows, um, he knows the Father's heart in a way that, that nobody else can. Um, and that to believe in him is to have eternal life, which is a way of pointing to um, that abundant life Jesus is going to talk about in John chapter 10 a little later on. It's not just everlasting life. Eternal life is to have the life of God, God's self. There's only one who's eternal. When Jesus says eternal life, I think you should just think about it's going to continue, but it's to have a life that is um, it's attached to that greatest joy of the Father. Yeah, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Mm. Any questions about that section or chapter 3 as a whole? One thing I'm seeing here is that I, I think that they're trying uh, to get the people to distinguish and understand the difference between worldly and godly and separate the two. Yeah. And yeah. it's uh, that's that was a difficult thing for me. And I, I think it's difficult for every human to realize that there is a distinct difference. And we've we've got to we've got to buy into that. Right. Right. And what where your greatest focus and concern is, yeah. All right, chapter four. Mm. There, we just knocked that out in 45 minutes, didn't we? Here. <laughs> Trying to get another chapter in here. Now, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, his popularity now was increasing, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. But I wonder why they'd have to add that remark to them. I mean, what's the purpose of... I wonder if it's... So nobody, I'm thinking about the early church. If somebody said, Well, yeah, Paul baptized you, but Jesus baptized me, could have been a uh, little right. rivalry thing. That would have been very divisive in the church mm -hmm. because it was already divisive if you were baptized by Paul. Sure. Right. Well, but this, uh, this says it comes from the Pharisees, and they were at first interested in John because they thought that he might upset the apple cart, and then all of a sudden, Jesus was doing greater things, and that made them probably more nervous. Right, yep. Jesus, verse three, Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Now, just a really quick geographical um, display here. Yep. Judea is in the, in the south. That's where Jerusalem is. And then Galilee is in the north. And right between Galilee and Judea is what? Samaria. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Samaria. And oftentimes, when Jews wanted to go from Galilee down to Jerusalem, like during the festivals and such, they would take this circuitous route 
so they wouldn't have to go into Samaria and see those people. And remember, we talked about that's from the Assyrians in 722 intermarrying with the Jewish people. But Jesus goes right through it, goes right through Samaria. He left Judea again to Galilee, verse 4. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, which has got to be a really important commodity in the desert, right? What? Whole cities are built around where the water is. And so Jesus, wearied as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. What time is that? Noon. Noon. High noon. Sun is at its peak. They're living in a desert. Translated means what? Thirsty. Thirsty. That's it. Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Um, it's hot. It's in the desert. Drawing water was a daily occurrence for any village. And who had to go draw the water every day? Women. The women and probably the children. And if you were part of the women and children to have to draw the water, when would you do that? In the morning. The morning, right. This would be, and, and it would be more than just a task. What else would it be? Social, yeah, social gathering. Social gathering. I mean, you can think about all the women and all the kids. They're walking together. They got their buckets. They go to the well, and they're chit-chatting all the way over there. They're chit-chatting all the way back. It's part of this community. Kind of imagine they would do it in the morning while the men were doing menly stuff someplace else. Unless, unless you had to go at noon alone. You must have been unclean. Could be unclean or just an outcast. We're not going to let her, the one with the reputation, the one who's already had five husbands, we're not going to let her join our club. She's probably already ostracized by the community. <clears throat> Jesus says to her, give me a drink, for his disciples have gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And interesting that they even have to translate this. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So obviously the intended audience doesn't really, there are probably some Greek audience that really doesn't know the, the bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans. So, again, how far do you unpeel this onion to absurdity? Jesus is a man he is alone at a well. A woman who is alone is going to the well. And the guy asks for a drink, knowing full well that they can't touch the other things of the other Samaritans. If you were a savvy woman who's had five husbands who know the way of the world, what might she be thinking right now? Pick the line to pick up. It's a pickup line. I'm thinking, let me just read it in a way that might suggest that. I, I, I might be reaching, I might be pulling down the, the, the peels to absurdity, but let me reach it, read it in such a way. Verse 10, Jesus answered here, if you knew the gift of God who is here before you, and who it is that's saying you give me a drink, you'd ask him, and he would have surely given you living water. Right. I heard every line 
now. But, you know, she knows the way of the world, and so she flicks her cigarette and then says, the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well's deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, drank from it the sons of his cattle? 13, Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but the water I give you, you will never thirst again. It will be a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the water, and the woman finally said, yeah, right, sir. Give me this water that I never have to come out here at noon again alone and meet anybody like you. Could it be that there's some interaction going on here? Because clearly they are crossing, Jesus is crossing cultural lines here by being alone with a woman from Samaria. Maybe, maybe, let's go on, verse 16, Jesus says to her, now he's taking a whole different approach, Jesus says to her, go, call your husband and come here, and the woman said, I don't have a husband, and Jesus says, you're right, you have no husband, you're right when you say I have no husband, for you've had five, and he whom you now have is not your husband. You've said this truly. And now suddenly it's going in a different direction. It's no longer two lonely people at a watering hole. But Jesus sees deeply into her soul, into her life. The woman said, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> That's an understatement, isn't it? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. You said that Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. That was the big, that was the big debate between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans were Jews. But the Jews would not allow Samaritans to come down to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. And so Samaritans had their own holy space. That they said, fine, we don't have to go to Jerusalem. We can worship here. So that's why she says, um, our fathers worshiped on this month, but you say in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. And 21, Jesus said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Uh, for salvation is from the Jews. That's a really tough sentence. Mine says this, for salvation is from the Jews. What does yours say? Same thing? Same. Yeah. Amen, yeah. brother. Thank you. How do, we, how do we understand this word? The Greek word is ek. How do we understand this word? Because it could be used again in two ways. And this is John. On the one side, Jesus could be saying that for salvation is originating from, has its origins in, it is from the Jewish religion, traditions, customs, teachings. Or, as Jesus now is going outside of Judaism to a despised neighbor, you could also read this is, for salvation is now being taken away from the Jews and going out into the whole world. It is from, taken away from. You don't know what John's gospel. You just don't know. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. That is, that is the goal of true worship, mm -hmm. spirit and truth. I had a great email dialogue today with somebody who said, Scott, you got to tell your congregation, I love that ownership part, um, that 
that it's it's we're done. You got to come back to church. We got this big we've got this big sanctuary, and if you start doing Christ home, people are going to be lazy. They're going to stay at home, and they're not going to come up and fill up that sanctuary. We won't have a full sanctuary. And I said, what is the goal? What is our overarching goal of the church? Is it to get people into the building? Is it to get names on a roll? Is it to bolster up a, 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 a budget? Is it to keep a brick and mortar institution going? Or is it to engage people to experience Jesus? To engage people to experience Jesus. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. Ultimately, Jerusalem, forget about it. This mountain in Samaria, forget about it. It's going to be worship that's in spirit and in truth. Part of this, part of this is probably getting at the historical setting. By this time, the Christians have been kicked out of the Jewish community. You know, after the death of Jesus, for like decades, Christians would still worship with the Jewish people, that is their origins on Saturday, the day of the Sabbath, and they would then worship again the next day, Sunday, the day of the resurrection. They would worship side by side for decades until about the year 70. And then somebody in the Jewish community said, Hey, they're not Jewish. You may call them Messianic Jews, but they don't believe what we believe. And after 70, they were kicked out of the temple and the synagogues. So Jesus here could very well be talking about the historical situation that's going on, telling the Christians, forget about it. They don't let you in the temples, forget about it. They don't let you in the synagogue, forget about it. This is not about getting into a building. This is about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Hold on today as well. So this is the separation that's going on between Christians and Jews. 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to her, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. Interesting, again, they have to translate that for the Greek people. <laughs> um, when he comes, he will show us the way. And here, drum roll, please. After this whole, Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. But he almost never does to anybody. Reveal himself this way, this blatant so right? Clearly, yeah. Yeah. And this is probably the first I am statement, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Just then the disciples came, they marveled. Mine says marvel, as you're saying. Surprise. They were freaked out <laughs> that he was talking to a Samaritan woman alone. If Jesus is a rabbi, you're not supposed to do this. Has any of you been to the Wailing Wall over in Jerusalem? There? Okay, good. When I was there, there were some um, rabbis of that very conservative Hasidic background, you know, and they had their disciples around them. And, and I saw a couple of them with their disciples holding umbrellas. Now, I was thinking at first that they were holding it because of the intense sun and, you know, and whatever else. No, they were holding it in front of his face. And they were leading him where they needed to go to the wall and other places here. And I asked my guide, what are they doing? <coughs> it had to do with here, that they marveled that he was talking to a woman alone. Wow. And so these disciples were shielding their rabbi's eyes from inadvertently looking lustfully upon a woman. And so the disciples were noticeably marveled, freaked out, surprised. But none said, what do you wish? Or 
while you're talking about <laughs> nobody asked him the obvious what are you doing so the woman oh now how do you understand this one so the woman left her water jar and went away into the city and told the people come and see a man who told me everything i did can this be the christ and the they went out from the city we're coming here why put in the details about dropping the jar now on the outside just you can run faster without a heavy clay jar full of water right all right go a little deeper she's leaving her past behind yes she's leaving it behind i'm no longer going to be the ostracized one i'm no longer going to be the separated one and she goes back into the village and she becomes the first Christian preacher. Pastor? Yeah. Uh, my Bible on 28 said, and she went into the city and said to the men, she didn't go back to the women that had been at the well earlier. Oh, mine says people. What is your saying? People. Said to the people. Yeah. people. Oh, okay. All the men you were. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we already knew. <laughs> But Scott, also, um, Jesus had just told her she wouldn't need that water anymore. She has the living water now. So why does she need the water? That's exactly it. Third layer. She doesn't need no stinking water anymore. She's never going to thirst again. Now, physically, of course, but spiritually, never again. This is a great, great text about the ordination of women back in 1970. For the ELs or the, the Lutheran Church back then. All right, do you want to pick it up? Sure. <clears throat> um, one of the things that makes Christianity different from the other two Abrahamic, Abrahamic faiths, Islam and Judaism, yeah. is that Judaism and Islam are both essentially religions of formal praxis of right practice. If you do the right things, even if your heart is not in the right place, you're essentially righteous. You, you're in good standing with God. If you pray five times a day, if you fast at the correct times, if you um, make the trip to Mecca and so on. Christianity, on the other hand, is, is not a faith of right practice. If you just do the right things, we know that as good Lutherans, right? What I love about how Jesus has carried out his ministry here is if, if you're, if you're going to set two people beside each other who can be the least similar, who have less in common, who would have less in common with the woman at the well besides Jesus than Nicodemus? Nicodemus is... Everything a Jewish person could be at the, the top of the line, the, the, and she is the exact opposite, so to speak, and neither of them got it on their own. When Jesus presents uh, this teaching, whether it's being born again or it's the living water, they both look at it with blank stares at first until, until the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of their heart, faith. Which is why Christianity is a, a religion of orthodoxy, a right belief. Of, it's a faith. And through faith, that's a gift from the Holy Spirit, we come to testify. We come to share the hope that is within us, which is what she does. And, you know, she doesn't say, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I've decided to follow you. But is there, to me, it seems really pretty powerful that it's her story that's the follow-up to this teaching on being born again. Because we've just seen it. What does it look like being born again or being born from above or being born anew? Well, look at the woman at the well. She's just experienced that. And she runs into the town to tell everyone. Then the, then the disciples come back. And one of the other big themes in John, aside from water and light, is this idea of food. Of food. What is the food that truly satisfies us? The whole chapter of John, chapter 6, is sometimes called the bread chapter because it's all about um, what is that real food that nourishes us. 
And over and over again, Jesus is teaching the disciples, you got to got to start looking at what's really going to satisfy your soul. And so we see a little example of that here. They come back, um, Rabbi, eat something. A good practical thing. <laughs> eat! You're so looking skinny! It's like a Jewish eat. mind. <laughs> you know, you're, you're looking so uh, famished here. I have food that you know nothing about. Which is what? What's Jesus mean there? Nourishment for the soul. Yeah, it's the word. It's the word of God and the promises of God. You know, and how often he turns to the word to, um, you know, we often say, well, with worship, I really, I felt fed in worship today. I felt like my, my heart was fed. This is where that language comes from. Then the disciples, I love their, their struggle to understand. Could someone else have brought him food? What is he talking about here? They sneak in armies and... Um, yeah, yeah. Hook them up. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. And then he talks about this image of harvest. You know, the area of Samaria around Sychar was famous for corn. They grew a lot of a lot of corn. So you can see him pointing out at these, like a, an Iowa cornfield and saying, look out at this harvest here. You didn't plant any of this, and yet you're going to get to harvest it. And I think what Jesus is beginning to do is talking about how um, God is going to, Jesus is going to prepare the way, and then the church will be his body to go out and to gather more and more people into the people of God. They're going to be the ones that harvest what they didn't sow or haven't worked for. Um, I think that's one of the definitions of ways that Jesus means that others have done the hard work. He himself, you know, on the cross and, and sharing his own life. And you will reap the benefits of the labor. You can also talk about that in just a very human way that a lot of times in our own discipleship, we may minister in ways where we're planners. We're not going to see the, the, the full fruit of that. Whether it's a person that um, comes in and plants a church, but then they move on and the next person gets to kind of see the the enrichment of, of lives more fully. Um, but I love that idea because, boy, right now, as we look around our country and world, the harvest is ripe, and there's so many opportunities. And back then, the big concern was about purity. We've heard tonight a lot about Nicodemus and baptism, and I don't know that people are so concerned about that today. How do I get pure? A lot of people, I wonder if they maybe already, well, I don't feel like I'm impure. What's maybe a big draw or longing that people have today that maybe the church can speak to? Any thoughts on that? What are people hungry for? Community. Community, yeah. Genuine community where you really know it and can know others. Good. I think it's another opportunity Christ's home will provide. You know, in that smaller, intimate setting, you can know each other in a deeper way. Any other thoughts? What are you hungry for? Maybe among all the information we have, to have some truth. Truth, yeah. They'll worship in spirit and in truth. You know, and that idea that there is a truth. There's, a, there's something solid I can put my teeth on. Good. I think another one is freedom. I think a lot of people are hungry for freedom, but they... Maybe assume that freedom means um, being yourself without any restrictions, doing what you want to do, and yet that ends up making you more of a slave than really free. Um, so I think the church has an opportunity with that too. Verse 39, the Samaritans from that town believe in him because of her testimony. I love the first, her testimony wins their hearts. And these are Samaritans putting their faith that the Christ is a Jewish rabbi, that, is, that would have been shocking to the early church, um, that Samaritans would accept Jesus in that way. And they're not always, there's going to be other places in the Gospels where Jesus is not welcomed by Samaritan people and villages and so on. But here they do. And Jesus stays with them for two days. Here he is in, their, in the enemy. He spends time to really get to know them, to share his life and his heart with them. Because of his words, many more became believers. And then they come back to the woman, what do you make of this? They say, we no longer believe just because of what you said. 
Now we've heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is savior of the world. Almost sounds like, why do you think they're saying that to her? Any thoughts? Kind of, kind of smarty, if you ask me. Sounds a little bit snarky. Yeah, almost. Probably because of her reputation. Um, yeah. But isn't that the goal? That ultimately we, we teach and preach and share our faith, all of us, that others would say, yeah, we see ourselves, who he really is. We, we, pre, we, we thank you for what you've done, but now we have that relationship with him too. Uh, that he is Savior. The, um, the word Savior is that word um, from the word salve, he, the healer of the world, the one who makes all things whole again. They're going to put their faith in him in that way. Good. And then to round out the chapter, the story of the official son. You want to speak on that? Okay. Second miracle. Second miracle, of course, the first being the water into wine. This is the second one, and they're all strategic. How many miracles are there in John's gospel? It's at seven. Seven, always the number, you know, always the number. It's either 43 or seven. 40 mm -hmm. or three. <laughs> all right, 46. So Jesus again came to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. We're assuming this official then is probably Roman, right? Yeah. Probably Roman, Gentile. 47, when he heard that Jesus had come from Judea, to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son for his point of death. And there, Jesus therefore said to him, Unless here are these contrary to fact things. If you do this, then that. If you don't do that, then this. Strong language. Unless you, and it's plural there again, I've got my notes here. <laughs> Unless you all see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So, so why do we do these miracles? Why do we do these healings? Why do we do the water? The water is not just to save the dad from the embarrassment. The healing is not just to answer the officials begging. It always points to it beyond itself. It's a sign beyond itself. So, just like the water into wine was a sign, a glimpse about that, that messianic age in which the, the hills would just flow with the good wine. Let's read this and let's ask the question, what does this point to? Verse 49, the official said, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus says, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. And as he was doing so, his servants met him and told him that his son was living. So we asked him the hour when it began to mend. And they said, yesterday, about the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed. And all his household. Now this is the second sign. All right, so what does this sign point towards? Probably a couple of things. Doesn't it show that that basically distance and space are not a problem for Jesus? Oh, good, good, yeah. He is not just another healer, because there were a lot of healers back then. Jesus was not the only healer. But this is a different kind of healing, isn't it? To be able to do it remotely, yeah, OK. That puts them at the top of the healers. <laughs> what else? Well, I mean, that shows in a way that he has to be connected to God if he doesn't have to even be there. Right, right. It really points to Jesus as being a person of God. Yeah. There's power over death. I mean, the, the implication is he did nothing to blame about that. I mean, so Jesus has the power over death, death being that enemy. Also, the um, man did not see, did not see the um, the signs and things, and he did believe. Jesus just told him this would happen, and he believed him. Is that right? Did the man see those? Mm -hmm. 
Belief comes first, doesn't it? Belief comes first. Jesus did it with just a word. Yeah. He also did it for all, not just Jews. He also healed all, not just Jews. That's it too. We see that the concentric circles around Jesus now are getting bigger and bigger. Not just for the Jewish people, not just for those righteous Jewish people like the Pharisees, but even for Samaritans who are still Jewish. <laughs> but now we're, that circle is going further out to the non-Jewish world. Yeah, it points beyond. And now we have another healing, chapter 5. After this was the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Hebrew called Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Any translation for that? What does it say? Oh, this was Bethsaida. Bethsaida. One, one is Beth, Bethzatha. Two is a yeah. Awesome. Okay. There's five, five particles. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew that he had been laying there a long time, he said, do you want to be healed? Is that a trick question? Do you, do you want to be healed? I, I wondered if he said that. Because he's been there so long. You know, maybe he thought, well, the pool's right there. If you got in, you'd be, maybe he thinks genuinely the guy, the guy's gotten used to this condition. And he's, I don't know. I, I, yeah, it just strikes me that maybe. But you're right. It's a good question. You know, we all know people whose illness is part of their identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all know people that have used their illness as their way of securing help from others. I can't do it because you're going to have to do it for it. Creates that dependency or whatever else. Now, in, in, in this pool in Bethsaida, for some reason, and nobody gave me a good explanation when I was over there seeing the pool of Bethsaida. Um, evidently, periodically, it just begins to roil. It is not like the guy or old faithful where every 57 minutes it, you know, it just, when you least expect it, it just roils. And the thing is, the first person in the water at the point of that roiling evidently is healed. Um, and here's a man who says, because here's the question, you want to be healed? The sick man answers, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is troubled, when it roils. And while I'm going down another step before me, uh, and while I am going, another step is down before me. He can't get there first. It's like me trying to get my COVID shot. It is! <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. He's trying. He right. wants to be healed. He's trying. Right. Yes, he does want to be healed. Jesus says, Rise, take up your pallet, walk. And at once the man was healed and took up his pallet and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. <clears throat> You know, it does often the case that really good laws or rules end up being ridiculous after a while. I was told I can't go swimming for two hours after I eat. <laughs> the Bible, of course, in Exodus, it was given as a gift. Former slaves who never had a day off, never had a day off. And then the third commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor, and one day you shall rest. I mean, to those Egyptian slaves, or slaves of Egypt, what a gift, huh? What a gift. Until somebody says, what, what is work? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I have some weeds in my garden, is that considered work? If I'm cooking for my family, and I enjoy cooking, does that work? If I make a fire, to, is that, you see how quickly, then the Pharisees or the scribes and the priests, they have to make all these rules. All right, this is work. You can, you can walk thus far and no more. So when I was, when I was, uh, I, you know, years ago, I did this radio program with the rabbi next door. And, um, and he was saying that, um, that um, he has to have somebody else turn on the microphone for him. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because it is electricity. And electricity is the modern equivalent of making a fire or a spark which is prohibited by the Torah. And he, so he can't, he can't do that. Hmm? I said, well, somebody's doing it. <laughs> Unless you have a Gentile yeah. down there who's doing that. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's doing it. So anyways, we, we all know good ideas that end up becoming burdensome. And this is one of them. That was the Sabbath, verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who was cured, it's a Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your pallet. They caught him on a technicality. Mm. But he said, the man who healed me said, take up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, who? Who is this one who said, take up your pallet and walk? Their feet. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as the crowd in the place, 14, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, hey, you look like you're doing well. Sin no more that nothing worse befalls you. How is that for a threat? Is that a threat? <laughs> Don't sin anymore. Well, that's a whole different conversation about <laughs> this, this idea about cause and effect. Because you can't read that and then assume, oh, that's why he was laid for 38 years. But we don't want to make that leap because scripture doesn't either. So it gets complicated. Sin no more that nothing befalls you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews persecuted Jesus because he did it on the Sabbath. The very last line here. And 17 gets at what I was talking about. It was a gift to former slaves. In verse 17, but Jesus answered that my father is still working and I'm working. This is why the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but called God his father, making himself equal with God. And right there, there is the line in the sand. Now, now it begins. The persecution against Jesus, the plots to kill him. Not only does he break the Sabbath, but he, he commits the worst of all blasphemies. He is making himself, if not equal to God, at least maybe the son of God. All right, you're going to remember verse 19 so we don't forget that next week. Verse 19, yeah. middle of chapter 5, yeah. I wanted to offer a suggestion um, as you read through John's Gospel, in, especially in between our classes, you know, they're being lit. Um, when it comes to prayer, and Pastor Melody gave a great sermon you didn't get to hear it earlier today. Uh, you can check it out on YouTube about the role of prayer and action. And um, whenever you have, whenever you read through John's Gospel, I'd like to invite you to take take some time on your own, pick one of the stories, and try to imagine yourself in the scene. It might be a quiet space in the morning. Um, 
Place yourself there at the well or in that, in that garden with Nicodemus and imagine what do you see, what do you hear? And then let the questions Jesus asks of them, let him ask them of you. So, will you give me something to drink? Or do you want to be made well? Rise, take up your pallet and walk. Take up the pallet and walk. Yeah, and see what, see what God brings to mind in your life. And then, you know, spend time with Jesus um, reflecting on that with him. And I think you'll maybe be surprised by some of the things that will surface as you hear these stories as Jesus' questions, not only to the woman or to the uh, Nicodemus, but to you and to me, to all of us as well. Um, yeah, thanks. Good deal. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you. 19.